Okay, so this is our second lecture of two lectures on external flow. We've covered and will not touch on flat plates today, but uh, we also covered the methodology for calculations, convective heat transfer problems. We talked about cylinders and cross flow, and today we'll just wrap it up with spheres. Tubes, banks of tubes, important but not covered. Impinging jets, important not but not covered, as well as packed beds. Last time we talked a lot about the golf ball. If you understand the fluid mechanics, you understand the boundary layer, it's turbulent, laminar, separated flow, then you have a good job of or are able to predict the heat transfer. I went and took a look so I didn't misspeak about the golf ball. Um, this is image of a golf ball, you can see the dimpling on it. In the early 1900s on the Wikipedia page, it stated that manufacturers began designing, making, and selling various types of golf balls with dimple patterns. And why? To improve the length after they hit it, how far it goes. The trajectory, maybe you even can get it to hang and then with some spin make it do some things in the air as well as when it hits the ground, what happens to it, how it deadens and stops where it hits. I'm not a golfer, but um, these things are important. In that same Wikipedia page, quite a bit about the aerodynamics, and so it's very easy to read, and they talk about the dimples on the golf ball are firstly to cause the boundary layer just like we talked, to trip, to be turbulent so that it can navigate and go around the backside, and reduce the size of the wake, which is a low pressure region, and hence reduce the overall drag. The ball will travel further. The second thing that they emphasized, I didn't emphasize, was that when you hit it and you're pushing it up into the air, there's naturally a spin to it. That gives it more of a lift, like an airfoil, the Magnus effect because of the spin. More air goes over top than underneath the ball, hence it has a longer flight because of lift. And then it's deadened when it hits. I think the trajectory is not as symmetrical as it would be. It's more like it goes up and then bump, deadens. All right. Uh, they show you a nice drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number. And they show you if you had a smooth ball versus a dimpled ball. So with the golf ball, for a smaller Reynolds number, you have a lower drag force, hence you go further. You go further. That's great. It's complicated. The fluid mechanics are complicated. And when you bring in now the heat transfer, it can be very complicated. Here they're showing you a local Nusselt number as a function of the angle starting from zero going all the way to 90 degrees and then all the way to 180 degrees. So 0, 90, 180. And they're showing you different Reynolds numbers. So as the Reynolds number change, the flow pattern changes and you get a very strong variation in the local Nusselt, hence the local convection heat transfer coefficient. A lot of that uh, detail is abstracted away when you use a very simple correlation, which is an averaging. So again, these are the simple correlations, which uh, averages over the complicated physics. How about non-circular cylinders and cross flow? It sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Non-circular cylinders, like a, what's a square cylinder? What? Either a cylinder is round or not. What do you mean square cylinder? But cylinder is like a long bar and then a square for the cross section. And it could be oriented this way or that way, hexagonal cylinder or hexagonal rod, and uh, oriented this way to the flow that way as well as a plate. Here they just have a simple, this is the coefficient C and M over a range of Reynolds numbers. So put C and M there and use it for a range of Reynolds number. In the textbook, there's a statement. You read that statement. There you go. What does that statement mean? What's the best answer for what that statement means? Uh, did I give you enough time? I know it's a lot to read, but do you need more time? No? You're good? All right, so we'll go ahead and stop.
you're reading the book, you hit a word you don't understand, what do you do? Keep reading and ignore it. No, 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 no. I know that's what we used to do, or sometimes I still do, but what do you do? You look it up in a dictionary. You can get a paper dictionary off the shelf, or you can get an online dictionary. You just type in define that word, and boom, you have a pretty good definition. So they even help you pronounce it. If you hit that button, it'll tell you pronunciation of that word. Who wants to attempt it? Sacrosanct. Sacrosanct. You, you're, you're good. All right. So here it is, especially of a principal place or routine regarded as too important or valuable to be interfered with. So it's sacred, it's hollow, it's respected, it's um, invulnerable, it's involatile, or unimpeachable, invulnerable, untouchable, inalienable, unquestionable. So with that definition of that word, I pose the same question to you. You have another chance at the same question before I grade it. Everybody in? All right, let's go ahead and stop it then. I know that this is a little tricky, but I have to ask these questions, and maybe you glean something out of it. But uh, look at the correlations have some utility. Otherwise, they wouldn't be put in the book. Right? So... I think they, they're used, they're in the book to be at least used, and so you can use them to make some calculations. So the calculations, though, shouldn't be like to the fourth digit of significance. You should, as one professor used to say, kind of a thumb width of data, you know, kind of like, oh, yeah, it's about a two thumb widths of variation in data around this line, this curve. Um, but anyway, so the best answer is these correlations have a lot of uncertainty. They have a lot of uncertainty. They can be trusted and used, but if you're a good design engineer, you probably want to compensate for at least 25% uncertainty. So maybe if you're calculating how long it needs to be, maybe make it a little extra long. Or uh, how many tubes you need, put more tubes in. I worked with a lot of people like, we calculated we need a five horsepower motor to drive that pump. They bought a 10 horsepower motor. It'll work. It'll work great. That 10 horsepower motor is not going to sweat like the five horse would. You know what I mean? It's not going to use much more energy either. It's just the upfront cost is going to get you a lot more. So anyway, now let's go back. Let's see if we improved at all. Probably not. Not as much as I wanted to see it. Let's move on. So now we can talk about a sphere. Um, a sphere, here is a correlation reported to be used for a sphere. It's a Nusselt number averaged over the sphere surface as a function of D for the diameter of the sphere. True? Okay. You have a constant plus you have some function of Reynolds number times Prandtl to the fourth. And then you have this viscosity divided by mu sub s to the one-fourth power. When you see this term, it's kind of a red flag. That's how they're going to help accommodate or take into account temperature-dependent properties in the correlation. You read the correlation restrictions. Don't use it for a Prandtl number outside of this range. Don't use it for a Reynolds number outside of this range. Question, do you interpret this statement as the Reynolds number needs to be between 3.5 and 7.6 times 10 to the fourth, or do you read it as 3.5 times 10 to the fourth to the Re Reynolds number 7.6 times 10 to the fourth? Answer A or answer B? 30 seconds only. All right, let's stop it at 30 seconds and then continue. All right. Uh, that would be an extremely narrow range for the Reynolds number, wouldn't you agree? But what's interesting is that caught my eye because that's a very low Reynolds number, isn't it? So this correlation covers a wide range of Reynolds numbers. So let's go ahead and grade it. So A is correct. Just think, just think about it, 23% of the class, 10 people. I mean... Wouldn't that be a very narrow, very narrow range, right? 
All right. Um, now, what about this? Well, restriction between mu and mu sub s. First of all, they say all of the properties for the Reynolds number doesn't have, have viscosity and density in it, but it's really the viscosity that is temperature dependent, u infinity d for the Reynolds number. Uh, that needs to be evaluated at t infinity. All of the, you know, that Prandtl number you evaluated at the fluid free stream temperature, ignoring the either hot or cold sphere falling through that fluid. But you, right here's the correction. Mu, that mu right there in this ratio is evaluated at the temperature far away, free stream, and that mu sub s is evaluated at the temperature what? Of the surface. That's really the only place that the surface temperature comes into play in this correlation. So when you see that, it's kind of like a red flag. Ah, that's the way they're accounting for. And often you don't use the film temperature, you use the free stream temperature for evaluating fluid properties in the rest of the correlation. Let's solve a problem. We have a 20 millimeter diameter sphere. It's made of steel. There's the thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity, and the mass density of steel. It's dropped in a large tank of water. The sphere is initially isothermal at a given temperature. It drops until the center line temperature is changed from 360 to 320, so it's cooling off. It's a hot sphere falling through water. And the water temperature, because it's a large bath, a large tank of water, stays constant at 280. So there's our three temperatures. The initial temperature of the sphere, the final temperature of interest of the center of the sphere, and the water temperature far in the large bath that doesn't change. The sphere may be assumed to quickly reach the terminal velocity in the water. What do you mean by the terminal velocity? Call hospice on us? What? No, no. <laughs> terminal is the free stream falling, right? All right. I want you to, I'm going to pause, and I'm only going to give you two minutes. I'm going to walk around. Look, how are you going to calculate? How are you going to estimate the terminal velocity? Start at the top. Show me your approach to calculate the terminal velocity. So the starting point is to say I'm going to do a free body diagram of the particle. And that free body diagram, you say the sum of the forces when it's falling at steady state is equal to, after it's done accelerating, the big zero. Now. That's nice. Now, some people are already starting to sketch the appropriate forces that act on this point or body, this sphere. But I have a question for you. In the force balance on the falling sphere, how many forces do you need to consider? One, two, three, four, five. How many forces? And then, what are their names? Describe them. All right, let's stop it. So, will the object fall without G? No. Up in space, you can play with these things. You let the sphere go in a bo bottle of whatever water, tank of water, and it's go just going to sit there. Right? So, here's our object. And so, one of the forces acting on it is the weight. The weight, the the force due to gravity, which is weight. How do I calculate it? Mg. How would I get the mass of the object? Well, they gave me the density multiplied by the volume of the sphere, and I have G. That's one force, the weight. Second force, somebody want to volunteer? Buoyancy. But most people would say another force before buoyancy. Drag. Drag. You've got the third force. Let me put the second force in first. And this is the drag force. How, what is the equation for the drag force? The drag coefficient times the frontal area times one half rho u infinity squared. 
That's the velocity pressure, dynamic pressure. Each of those three terms. You just unravel the drag coefficient. That gives you the drag force. So it's the A sub F. Okay, hey, I forgot. What is the equation for the volume of a sphere in terms of the radius of the sphere? 4 thirds pi r cubed. What is the frontal area of the sphere based on r? I'm going to give you clicker choice A or to clicker choice B. It'll either be pi r squared or 4 pi r squared. It'll be either answer A or answer B, and now you have a chance to input. I want to know the frontal area of that sphere used in the drag force calculation. Whatever you want to call it. What, do you, what other word did he call it? Now, somebody said that we didn't call that in our class. Okay, then somebody volunteer. What did you call it? Frontal area? Okay, that's what I called it. What did you call it? Silhouetted area? That's a pretty good descriptor. Come on, somebody else. Projected area? If there's a big sphere sitting over there and I look in that direction, I see a two-dimensional blockage. That two-dimensional blockage is my frontal area, projected area, silhouetted area. So which one is it? Pi r squared. You know, if I give a problem like this on the exam, I know where to look for wrong answers. No, not now you won't. That's good. Very good. All right. Now, uh, the other force that you had correctly observed, what a lot of people would fail to put on there because it's submerged in water, isn't it? And because it's submerged in a fluid like water, there's an additional third force, isn't there? Did I ever grade this one to say that there's three? No. So I have to grade it. There were three. You know how many people missed it? Only a third of the class knew there's three forces acting. Did you put in three? Good, very good. So, now somebody's playing with me, or two people are playing with me. <laughs> they said, oh, only one force is... You know, how can you have the sum of forces equal to zero with only one force? I guess it had to be a zero force. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Now I have another question for you. What principle is used to calculate the buoyancy force? I think it's Euler's principle. No, I think it's Bernoulli's principle. No, 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 I think it's Newton's principle. It's Archimedes' principle or it's Stokes' principle. All right, where everybody's in, let's stop. What is it? It's Archimedes' principle. Now that we know the name, now help, that'll help us recall what, how you write Archimedes' principle. What is, what, it, how, what is the statement of Archimedes' principle? The buoyancy force equals the weight of the water displaced by the submerged object. So now that we can say it in words, we can write it out that this buoyancy force, I didn't leave enough room there, so I'll write it down here, is equal to the weight of the, submer of the displaced fluid that's displaced by the submerged object. So the volume of the object is going to displace that much water, the mass of water, which G gives you the weight of the water that's displaced. What's the only difference between the weight is this density and that density? Water versus the steel sphere density, the density of the steel sphere. So when we come back, we're going to write an equation that says that the, uh, the density of the steel times the volume of the sphere minus the density of the water times the volume of the, of the uh, let, let's multiply both of these by G, right? So the buoyancy is up, the weight's down. Then we also have going up is the uh, drag force which is uh, C sub D, the frontal area, silhouetted area, projected area, um, times the uh, one-half rho U infinity squared to zero. The density, this is down 
this is uh, up, this is up. Or put it like this, put an equal sign, there you go. So now what we can do is we can solve u infinity is equal to the square root of, then we're going to have the density of the steel divided by the density of the water. Isn't this the density of the water in the one half row u infinity squared? Okay, minus one, that'll be good there. Then we'll have the g, and then we'll have the two, and then we'll have area frontal volume C sub D. <sighs> Did I miss any term? The area, I got the area. Okay. And so then the volume divided by the area frontal, the volume is um, 4 thirds pi r cubed. The area is pi r squared. Pi's go. And so it's 4 thirds r. And so this uh, becomes 4 times 2, 8 thirds r divided by c sub d rho of the steel rho of the water minus 1 times g square root. I always double check my units, but I think that's correct. You give me a thumbs up if you like that equation. Is it okay? Got a couple thumbs up? Couple thumbs up? Good. So now, uh, use of infinity, what I can do is I can put all those constants together. It's 1.793 divided by c sub d square root. What do I do now? Because I don't know the drag coefficient. How am I going to get the drag coefficient? I gave you a handout, did I not? And so the handout shows the drag coefficient is a function of the Reynolds number for this smooth sphere down here. That's what we're dealing with. Uh, it could vary from way up in here all the way through this. This is the whole line, isn't it? So what's my drag coefficient? I don't know the free, I don't know, I got to calculate the Reynolds number. In order to calculate the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number is u infinity d over nu. I have to know this free stream, you know, falling velocity. The, the free, the terminal velocity to calculate the Reynolds number. So I'm kind of stuck. What do I do? I use this analogy uh, from my, when I was very young. I remember being a little kid on the playground, and I loved to play on one of these things in the schoolyard. Do you, anybody? Does that resonate with anybody? And those were very popular, and they would be full of people. And there wouldn't be much room on it. So what did you do? You kind of kind of ran around and you would look for a place to grab on and you grabbed on and you just went. It really didn't matter if you assumed C sub D first or Reynolds number first or U infinity first. You just got to get the job done. You got to guess, get in there and grab somewhere and then iterate. That's what you got to do. This gives people, I don't know, some sort of anxiety, you know. I, I'm not going to be able to guess a good number. We'll try to figure out which one might be easier to guess and then guess there. So I looked back at this data and I said, you know what? I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to guess a Reynolds number that comes up, hits the line, so it's easy to read off C sub D. And I'm going to go from there. That's the way I did it. So I started by grabbing the Reynolds number and going. You could have started by grabbing a C sub D and going. But look it. Look at the range of the C sub Ds. If somebody says, I'm going to use a C sub D of 4,000, you're going you're to put yourself in a predicament where it's not probably going to converge. Or I'm going to grab a C sub D of 0. 0.000001. No, no, no. Look at the range. It's not reasonable. I, I grabbed the Reynolds number 100. And I read off a C sub D for that to be about 1.0. I then go over and I calculate U infinity from the equation that I just described, 1.793 divided by C sub D. And it comes in roughly at U infinity, comes in at about 1.3 meters per second. All right. Now, I then go back and I want to get an updated Reynolds number, don't I? So that Reynolds number is rho U infinity. Uh, let's put 
u infinity d over nu. This property right here is of what the fluid, the water, but it's temperature dependent, and I really want to do a good job. So somebody says, here are the temperatures of interest. The sphere is initially 360 Kelvin. The center drops down to 320. That's the time period of interest of me falling through this fluid. And the water is always constant at 280. I want to evaluate that property, the viscosity, at the film temperature. What is the average film temperature? All right, let's go ahead and stop it. So uh, the surface temperature starts and the surface temperature goes to that what is the average surface temperature during this time period of interest where it's falling? 340, isn't it? 340 Kelvin. What's the film temperature? It's the surface temperature plus the free stream temperature divided by 2. That's the film temperature. What we're, well, we have a varying surface temperature, so use the average surface temperature. So it's 340 plus 280 divided by 2. 310. I heard it. Yes, sir. So, so somebody says uh, it's not quite three, 310 because I don't think the sphere is isothermal. You're exactly right. But it's a first approximation. Okay, so now with that, I get the 310. I can get the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number jumps to 37,600. Uh, my first guess of 100 on the Reynolds number was not that good, was it? But I look up on my, and I want you to do that right now. I gave you that chart handout. Give me C sub D. The first person to give me C sub D, raise their hand, and I'll call on you. 0 0.4. That's pretty good. That's very good, actually. So what you do is uh, make sure that you can read these diagrams. Okay, where did it go? I've got to find my diagram. It's lost. There it is. So this is uh, 10, 10, 10K. What's that line? 20,000. What's that? That one. That one. This probably is 80K. This is 60K. That's 40K. They, didn't, they started skipping some lines in there. That's how they do it in log plots. True? So if I came in at about 37.5 thousand, then that's close enough to 40 thousand. I'll come up right here, and you just read off. Somebody might say, it looks to me closer to 0.5. More power to you. That was my first read, too, 0.5. Okay. So now uh, I put in 0.4 or 0.5. You then put into the equation, it becomes 2.11. Do it again, the Reynolds number jumps to 60,000. So then it comes in around 0.4. It actually comes in 0.41, and then it comes in 2.09. Now you say, how did you ever get, four? well, I used an equation that I found because, of course, somebody's going to curve fit it. <laughs> Somebody sat there and said, I don't like reading this. I want to put it into Excel or somewhere and curve fit it. So they curve fit it, and I used that correlation. It's not a pretty correlation, but it's just a curve fit. All right. So that's the end of part A. The U infinity is around 2.1 meters per second. Professor, why don't we get three significant digits? Are you good at reading that diagram for the drag coefficient out there that far? Not really. You could go back and try to modify for the updated improved film temperature, but you know what? It's going to go out in the wash because you don't even get C sub D that accurately. But you could. You could improve the film temperature estimate. Now let's move to the next part, which is the heat transfer part. What is the height of the water tank needed to cool the sphere? So you have the water and you want to have a sufficient height. Right away, as soon as it gets into the water, it's assumed that it falls at U infinity. So what is the height, the minimum height needed for it to go from that temperature to that temperature of cooling down? Well, if you knew how, how much time was required, right? You know, U infinity is some distance traveled over some time 
Is that a good relationship from dynamics? Yeah. So the height will be the time that you need it to fall so it can transfer enough heat times the speed at which it's falling. How are we going to get the time needed to transfer that heat? It's just like the lump capacitance. You hope lump capacitance works. Um, so, so you go and you check the BO number for this problem. It's H, critic, uh, characteristic length divided by K. I have to calculate now H from first principles. So I go and I say, hmm, I have a falling sphere. I know the velocity. And I use that correlation that I gave you a copy of. And I don't want to repeat it here, but it's that Neusselt average as a function of Reynolds Prandtl, right? I have to use T infinity to get most of the properties. The temp temperature of the surface is 340, so I can get that mu sub s. Does, do you understand where I'm going on that? So you, you, you're, you're able to get that Reynolds number, you're able to get the Prandtl number, you get the Neusselt number, the Neusselt number comes in at uh, um, 1, 2, 6, 5, 1. And then you unravel it to get the, um, the H. I'm sorry, that's the H. The Neusselt number comes in at 400 and about 40, 435 using that correlation. Watts per meter squared degree C. That's pretty high convection coefficient on the H. Now what do I do? I want to check the BO number. When I check the BO number, the characteristic length is radius of the sphere divided by 3. The BO number comes in at 0 0.703. What do you think? Lump capacitance justified? Nope, it is not. So yes, your suspicion about the surface temperature and the internal temperature is correct. So now I have to do a transient. I can do an infinite summation of those terms, or just the first term if the Fourier number is greater than 1. I'll assume the Fourier number is greater than 1 and check it after I make the calculations. So I go and I look for that uh, theta star is equal to the C1 e to the minus zeta 1 squared Fourier number. Remember that equation? And you check it for the BO number not based on the characteristic length, but the BO number based on the R. The BO number based on the R is 2.108. You go to the table in chapter tran on the transient conduction, and you find that the zeta 1 is about 2.026. And the C1 is about 1.478. The theta star, you know the temperatures. It, that theta star turns out to be the uh, 0 0.5 for these three temperatures. So I calculate that the Fourier number is just using this equation right here to calculate the Fourier number. I calculate the Fourier number to be 0. 264, then I unravel the Fourier number to calculate the time. The time is the Fourier number, R squared over alpha. And when you calculate that time, it's about 1.5 seconds. You take the time of 1.5 seconds times the velocity that is falling, about 2.1 <coughs> meter per second, and you calculate that it needs to be a height of about 3.1 meters. Greater than or equal to about 3.1 meter. If you're designing this, what are you going to do as a design engineer? If it's not expensive to make a little larger tank, double it, right? And so make a 6 meter tank or 5 meter tank. Or, OK? So that's how you use these equations. I wanted to solve that problem. I wanted a little more interactivity during this part, but I was unable to do that because of time constraints. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. A second ago, you said balance time for the temperature to reach 340. That's right. For the temperature in the center of the sphere to go from 360 to 320. Okay. So 320.
Yeah. So we're done with this chapter. We'll move into the next chapter next time. Thank you for your attention.